Hi everyone, I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today and I've been a space and astronomy journalist for over 20 years. And I do lots of questions, lots of bring, bring you lots of news, but I also like to talk to people behind the scenes, interview people who are actually working on some of the interesting stories that we are producing for Universe Today. And today I'm joined by Scott Peterson. Hey Scott, how's it going? Very good, how are you? Good, so the question I always like to ask people is, who are you and what do you do? Yes. So as you said, my name is Scott Peterson. Um, I am a husband, a father of two wonderful, intelligent little boys. Um, I am a veteran of two horrible wars. And um, now I'm kind of known as a micrometeorite guy. So I find little tiny bits of the universe on rooftops. And I remember like when your work and and you know, a couple of other people out there hunters out there were starting to make these discoveries. And this idea of being able to pull to detect and actually find and and sort out micrometeorites was kind of thought impossible. And yet, here we are pictures, the scientific data is pretty overwhelming at this point. So I guess, what how did you come to this conclusion that that there was a way to find meteorites closer to home than flying down to Antarctica and, and uh, looking across the surface of the ice? Well, it'd be fun to be able to do that as well. Hopefully that'll come in the future. But it was macro meteorites. Yeah, I think back in um, maybe like 2015, 2014, um, there was just some like horrible articles out there saying that you could just go on your rooftop in your gutters and find anything that was magnetic. And that was a meteorite, a micro sized one. Um, so I started doing that and then I found magnetic things and I've always been like science minded. So I was somewhat cautious, but at the moment that was the only information out there. So I was like, Oh, I found myself a meteorite. And then there was a, another article that came out equally as incorrect that said that it just need to be spherical. So I started, I was like, Oh, what I found wasn't a meteorite. So I looked for little spherical things and then I found those. And then, um, it came to my, uh, John Larson wrote a book and yes. I reached out to him and then he basically became a mentor, but, um, he was the first person to find the micrometeorites, and then I became basically the second. But um, the, they don't need to be round. They don't need to be magnetic. They need to be micrometeorites in a whole lot of different ways. So I just kind of realized how wrong I was in the past, and I just wanted to actually find one. So I made it my mission to actually find one, and then I did. So tell us the story of what's happening from space. Like what's going on that's bringing these these objects to our rooftops? Yeah, so they're they're everywhere. They're in our solar system. Um, they're they come from comets. They come from asteroids, and they're just moving around. And they're small in space. So a lot of people think that um, it, as like a large meteor comes in, and then uh, little ablations will come off of it. That those can be micrometeorites, but Indeed, micrometeorites are, are small themselves the entire time. So they'll come in cruising at seven miles a second and uh, slow down once they hit our atmosphere, burn up, they'll melt completely, um, and they'll recrystallize into different types of um, structures. And then that's kind of how we base hmm. the, the characteristics. Of, like, that we'll name them based off like, kind of how they look. Is um, there a maximum size? Like at a certain point, they just... <clears throat> they just turn it because I mean, like, I know that like, when we go outside and we watch a meteor shower, and, and when every time we see a meteor, they are smaller than a grain of sand, they're tiny, and they're right. and they're burning like the big ones, like the really big ones that leave a streak. Those are like the size of a grain of sand. And if you're really lucky, you see one that's bigger, and, and will crackle and pop and break open in small pieces. So is there sort of like a, a, a maximum size to where they just suffer too much damage, and they're gone? Yeah, so uh, if you think about it, if it's too big within a certain range, it's just going to heat up too much and it's going to burn away. If it's too small, the same thing's going to happen. It's just there's not much material there. So there's a, a sweet spot. Um, most of the micrometers that I find are in between 0.2 millimeters and 0.4 millimeters. 
So they peak around about around that size. Um, I find them smaller and I find them larger, but that's the that's the main size range. And so and so these things are are hitting the atmosphere. They are they're burning up to some extent, and then mm -hmm. and then I guess they get decelerated, and then what happens? Um, so then they'll either get stuck in the air streams and fly all around the world, or they'll slowly come down and they'll land everywhere. I mean, they're on your road, they're in your grass, they're completely everywhere. Um, I mean, I know that there's like a hundred tons of material is hitting the earth every day. Yeah, it's a weird number. I, it's I'm not sure about the exact because it changes so often. But yeah, it's it's a lot. There's more micrometeorites by number and by weight than there are of actual large meteorites that, that hit huh. the yeah, that's, so it's a, that's amazing. And you just think about this. This has just been happening day after day, year after year for since the the formation of the Earth. Yeah, that, I mean, that's how maybe we got water that way. And I think there was a recent article out that said we got all of the amino acids and everything from uh, from meteorites now. They've all been found in there. So, yeah, they, they come in, they land everywhere. It's about one per square meter per year that's the average oh interesting okay okay so so it's a pretty um equation yeah it's not really perfect probably but it's it's about there so um, and then there's there's pollution everywhere so that's why i uh i go up to the to the rooftops trying to trying to lessen the the signal to noise ratio Right. So, so the, so these things are falling down, as you said, about a meter, one per meter per year. And so obviously that includes the rooftop. So, so then I guess, pick up the story. How, how do you search for them? Uh, yeah. So it's the hardest part is me just going on Google and then looking for the, for the right type of roofs. I usually use, um, uh, like flat old, um, they need to be like vinyl just because some rooftops here are, They'll have rocky tops and it's just it's impossible to find them in that so uh, then i email the owner and see if they'll let me up and most of the time everybody says no you're crazy but luckily i've kind of got like the format and the uh, history where some people will take me seriously so but once i get up there then i just take a uh, really powerful neodymium magnet and go around to all of the low-lying areas where either like the rain is going to bring it in towards the mm -hmm. Um, like all the drainage area or wind will push it into the corners. So I just go everywhere where there's dirt and pick up as much magnetic material as possible. And like, you know, I have a metal roof on my, uh, on my studio and, you know, we only put the roof on maybe six months ago. So I'm guessing then there's gotta be a few dozen micrometeorites up there. Uh, there. Is there any, and you know, going into the, the gutter, um, so is there any reason why you like, like you don't use metal? I can totally understand why you wouldn't use, say the asphalt roofs with the, with the, um, sort of like almost rocky quartzy coating because it's just like too much noise, but a metal roof, would that work? Um, <clears throat> yeah. As long as you're probably looking through your gutters to find everything. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Cause then you're, you're, you're not having a lot of the shingles on, on rooftops will have the, the little stones that they're made out of. And some of those are magnetic. So that's just material that you'll collect up. Um, a metal roof would be great. If you could use any like, gutters and find the dirt that's in there. Yeah. <coughs> then just go look through that. And then pull <clears throat> and pull that through. Now, um, okay. So, so you've, yeah, you've gone to some person's roof. You've run a magnet across their roof. The magnet is covered in particles w what happens next so i will take that bag of dirt home hopefully it's a really large bag filled with a lot of micrometeorites um and i'll take it home and put all the material into a bucket and just clean that out so i'll rinse it out until all of the organic material comes out usually that will float to the top so i just pour it out all of the really 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 tiny particles um, they will kind of float around too, and I'll pour those out. So I do that continuously until the water is kind of crystal clear. And surprisingly, uh, the the micrometeorites, I mean, they fall pretty quickly in, in the water. So they Those are go. metal. Yep, exactly. Yep. And so I'll just uh, keep doing that. And then um, 
I have sieves that I sieve everything. So I, I use these for uh, there's different size holes that are in them, and yep. then I will sieve everything, um, and that will kind of help me put everything in the in the right size to both help look underneath the microscope, but also kind of get rid of anything that's too large or too small. So right. I can focus right in that 0.2 to 0.4. The ones that should have burned up, as we mentioned earlier. Okay, so you've now, you've sieved out all of the stuff, you've sorted your little pieces of metal, um, and then what do you do? So now I let everything dry, and then I use, I do it different than everybody else. Everybody, well, this is one of the first people to do it, but most people will look under like a, a stereo microscope, and they will just kind of like look underneath the plate and they'll move things around. I uh, I take everything and put it on a magnet uh, again, and then put it on a piece of, of tape, and then put it on a little a little slide. And I'll look underneath my uh, compound microscope, and I just kind of look like uh, like you're uh, all overlap. So I'll, I'll go this way, and then kind of like you're painting something, you kind of go over it again, and I just go through the entire slide until I pick out possible microwaves. Sometimes you can see them right away and then sometimes you don't know so i just pick out everything and then i'll go look at those closer what is the uh, what is the ratio do you think like if you put a whole bunch of stuff onto a slide i'm assuming there's going to be hundreds or even thousands of particles on the slide yeah. how many meteorites are you sort of expecting to find <clears throat> systematically in that it's tricky it just it depends on the roof it depends on um like so many factors on um, uh i went on this 100 year old roof in minneapolis that i thought was going to be amazing and i was going to just find tons of micrometeorites um and then when i got home and cleaned everything and looked underneath the microscope there was millions of little spheres so from whatever happened they must have been doing like construction on the roof or some type of Something that created all these spheres because there was so many of them. Like air and, pollution of some variety. Yeah, and it's it so I have to look through those as well because they're similar looking and they it it, it makes it really difficult. So but on on other roofs, I've gone to uh, an abandoned uh, mall that's near my house and it's uh, it, it's unbelievable how many I have found on that roof. You can look underneath one and almost see one every time. So <clears throat> it's hard to say like the ratio because it, right. it changes so so much but but i mean like 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 say on the on that that roof of the shopping mall you <clears throat> you're seeing one per slide or you're seeing a few per slide or you're seeing half of them are 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 the meteorites yeah it, well it, it's just it's all by chance it, it'll mix it up sometimes you'll see maybe two or three on a slide sometimes you'll go through three or four slides and not find anything okay okay so, yeah it's just it's it's but i mean even if you could average it down it's, it's just really hard to do there's there's not like one per slide or or something like that it's right it's less than that even on a, on a good roof and you so then to... obviously knowing how to identify these things is is the key so so when you're looking through all of these these objects and, and I mean you've already they've already passed a lot of criteria right they're metallic they're magnetic yep. they're the right yep. size they are and they don't they're not covered in organic material like at a certain point you've got a whole bunch of tiny little pieces of metal that are 0.2 to 0.4 millimeters across on this slide how do you tell them apart how do you know which are the fakes so it's good, good you said metallic because they they don't look metallic so they they'll be really dark in in color they have a lot of texture to them so the light is bouncing off them in a lot of different ways unlike <clears throat> all of the, the other fake spheres that i'll find they're usually perfectly round uh somewhat smooth and they look metallic like you look at them underneath the microscope and they look like they're metal micrometeorites they will look completely different um but they they traveled through the Earth's atmosphere, right? So they're somewhat aerodynamic, and they'll have huh. they'll have different shapes to them. They're not going to be perfectly perfectly round, even if they were completely melted. Um, some of them will be like uh, the glassy types. They tend to be more round, just because they more uh, surface tension probably on them as they're as they're there. But 
most of them will have um they'll be darker in color they'll be not perfectly round um <clears throat> they'll have like the most common type by far is uh barred olivine and you'll see these little lines within them so the the bars that you can see and that's a great indicator you'll you'll see uh, the structures of them so the more and more you look at obviously the more it's you're able to see what they are and even now there's i, I pick out everything because there's new types that i find there's odd ones that you see so yeah so so like what do you think is the source of the fakes or what is it because i mean when you think about it it's a little weird that you've got a roof that is covered in little pieces of metal yeah. that are coming from not space right yeah. like it has to be some kind of human industrial process is this just air pollution is this coal pollution what's and and, and and yeah where's it coming from everything it comes from um cigarette lighters it comes from um power tools it comes from fireworks even like uh on the road when um you have like the the painted yellow lines or the painted white lines and they put these little reflective material on top of that those little reflective spheres um are similar looking to they can kind of confuse you. They're they're about the right size. They're usually clear, but I mean, if you found one, you'd be like, "Oh, I found a micrometeorite." Um, so there's a there's a lot there's a lot of tricky things, and they they come from and, anything. And, from, and these are, I mean, I guess because they're so light, they're they could have come from other countries, and so, like they're 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 yeah. going a great distance. They're in the air somewhere. They're being generated somehow. They're traveling around the world like the meteorites. And then they're raining down on your, on your roof, or yeah. you're breathing it in. Like it's sort of, sort of a little unnerving to when you think about how the sausage is getting made here. It's a little unnerving to think that that yeah, sure we're occasionally breathing in micrometeorite particles, but most of the time we're breathing in little jagged spherules of metal from fireworks or ammunition or road construction or anything it's kind of yeah you got to be like oh this is everywhere it, it, it's it's sad it's crazy just to see like the amount of stuff that you can find on a on a rooftop that should not be there but it, it, it's it's somewhat local as well because i've gone to places like like that old roof or um up in duluth minnesota it's it's iron country so there's just like it was just completely complete uh polluted up there um with iron spherules from different things but yeah it's it's yeah but i wonder like you know i'm in canada um fairly not remote but you know um less air pollution up here than than i'm sure where you're located i wonder if that would change the the consistency of the kinds of stuff that we see but yeah it'd it's be interesting yeah well I, I, like there's you know i i chose to interview you for a reason dude i mean <laughs> i'm gonna totally get into this because this is awesome um so okay so so let's talk about these the actual meteorites so you you gave some some ideas of how to identify them like they've got some kind of aerodynamic shape i guess because of as they hit the atmosphere and started to melt a bit they they form a a bit of a shape related to that that's really cool yeah, well, there's two reasons. Um, they don't necessarily come in perfectly still coming into the to the same direction. So most of them will have spin. And uh, you can see that in different different types. So um, some of them will be kind of elongated. And on those um, spots, there will be some that have I got a little picture right here. Um, so there'll be the, the little metal bead. Um, that is just uh, like the heavier elements, uh, kind of as they melted as well. Um, well can, you, can you show? Sorry, can you show that picture again? I've, I've got to. I'm gonna have to describe this for the podcast people. So yeah, you're showing this kind of black sphere with a goldish little circle that is on one part of it. And so you're saying that that it's as it spun and as it was, I guess, molten it spun out the heavier elements into a blob onto one part of the micrometeorite. Yep. So, well, there's two different ways that that'll come out. Um, if you think about it, it, it's so it's this heavier little more it's iron nickel bead that's inside of it. And as it's coming in through the atmosphere, um, the atmosphere is slowing down the, the micrometeoroid and it, it is uh, 
just slowing down, but the heavier uh, mass has more momentum and it wants to kind of keep going. So sometimes they will get out and freeze. I'll send you some pictures later where they'll freeze like right as they're coming out. Um, sometimes they'll freeze right after they come out, but sometimes they'll get stuck right right there so you can see the beads on them. Wow. Or if they're rotating, the same thing will kind of happen. It'll push the heavier elements out to the side. So you can have elongated ones that look like uh, like a football shape and they'll have little metal beads on the ends of them. Huh. That's amazing. Um, and so, I mean, that's one example. That feels like, you know, you see that and you're like, okay, there's there's not a lot of ways this could form from an angle grinder or a, or a piece of yeah. firework. Maybe. Who knows? Um, yeah. what, what work has been done to scientifically prove that, yes, indeed, these things that look cool are actually from space? Well, we've done a lot. A lot and a little at the same time. So as I was saying before, John Larson was the first guy to actually find them. And at that point, too, they were just everybody was saying, no, there's yeah. way too much pollution. You're not going to be able to look through all of that stuff and find true micrometeorites. Um, but luckily, we've already found them in some of the ways that you mentioned earlier from like the South Pole water well or just in uh, different places, basically, where there is no pollution or very little pollution so you know what you find is a micrometeorite because there's nothing else that can be down there um so we have the um chemical makeup of what those um uh, what those are and the things that we have found and assume are micrometeorites match those completely so that's basically been the way that i know like some things will be really confusing looking new looking and if I don't know 100% that it is a micrometeorite, I'll do a chemical analysis on it. And every single micrometeorite that I have has the same chemical makeup. Now, when you do chemical analysis, what are you doing? Um, so there, I'm fortunate to have been able to work with the University of Minnesota, and they have a probe lab there. So they're able to... I wish I knew exactly what was going on, but they shoot um, like x-rays. Okay, so they've got a mass spectrometer. They've got a mass spectrometer. Yep. And so, are, now, are they actually just zapping the micrometeorite, or are you actually having to to powder it? And like they give oh, it back to you when they're done with it. Yep. Okay. It's not, it's not, it's not damaging. <laughs> okay, good, good. And outside, you can, I, there's not too many people. I got a little show and tell. Um, but I've been able to uh, polish them so you can basically cut them in half basically you take away the top part and you can see the inside of them um but i the first person to be able to polish both sides of them and then look through them with uh cross polarized light so hmm. i've got some amazing images of uh, the colors that you can see looking right through them and the and, crystals of the inside right i mean i guess like they're metal and they form these crystals as they as they they formed and so you can actually see the crystalline structure of the metal but it's thin enough that you can actually see through that's a, that's incredible um so so you guys are, are pretty sure that you're you know based on the scientists who you're handing these samples over and they're running a mass spectrometer are are, are the scientists interested in in what you're finding yeah uh luckily it's just been it's been a a fun little journey to go through because i've met a lot of amazing uh, scientists that work on it. So I work with them all the time. I send them things that I find because um, it's it can be of importance somehow. Uh, there's different features that I find, and I find a lot of them. So if I find a group that looks similar or they have similar features, I can send those out to them and they can uh, identify those, do some um, research on them and see what, see what the, why it happened or something like that. So um, yeah, it's been pretty great to be able to work with all of the the people that actually do research on them from a day to day basis. Now, the metal meteorites, I mean, the, account for only about 15% of the asteroids out there in the solar system, the vast majority of them are the rocky ones, the carbonaceous chondrites, things like that, mm -hmm. you can't pick them up with a magnet. Have you thought about ways that you might be able to find microscopic stony meteorites well so it's hard to think they are in a way right so um when they melt there's little tiny bits of like the iron or nickel in there and then that's what makes it um magnetic so even within the um 
the stony ones that would come in if there's a tiny bit of um of iron or nickel in them which there are in some of the um other meteorites then then that makes these magnetic so the only one micrometeorites that are not magnetic are um the glass ones that are just completely glass that don't have any metal in them but i don't know if uh if there would just be like a, a rocky micrometeorite well there I, there would be i mean like as i said the you know most of the meteorite like when they go down to say antarctica and they they drive around and they're looking for rocks on the ice that could only have come from space yep. the vast majority of them are the stony types mm -hmm. and the the vast majority of the asteroids in the just all of the debris around the solar system is the stony material. These yeah. iron ones are, are rare. They're like I said, about 15% are actually just are the ones made of, of metal, and I can totally get that there's a mixture, there's some metal, and some rock, as long as yeah. there's any metal, then it gets caught by the by the magnet. I don't find any of the iron ones. So huh. being a, yeah, so oh, the, interesting. Well, they probably... the, the ratio would be like one to 100,000, I think. Uh, I might have like two or three. I, I picked some out that I believe are um, eye types, um, but I don't, it, for me and for all of the, um, well, so it's, they're indistinguishable from the, the fake ones so far. There's no way to identify them as a true micrometeorite yet, except uh, John Larson. So being able to find a uh, iron micrometeorite is is almost impossible, right? It's not, but it's a very, very small choice. And he did find one. And the way that he was able to confirm it is because it had a little uh, platinum nugget on it, which some of our micrometeorites will have. They'll have the, the platinum nugget on it. So he found one that way. Um, they find them, yeah, all the time in uh, in the, the South Pole. Mm -hmm, but, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I, I have one. And... It's oh, yeah. like, but it's big, right? Like it's, it's about a, it's about a pound and, yeah. but it rusts. And so I'm constantly having to treat this meteorite. You, you, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I got, yeah. So yours is, yours is a slice. Mine is just like a, like a rocky ball yeah. um, or a metal ball. Um, and, and so I can imagine like the second it lands on the earth and it's subject to, the rain, you know, if it is made of metal, it's going to rust away in a heartbeat. So, yeah. so they just can't last long. But if you've got like a, like a piece of rock with a chunk of platinum embedded in it, uh, is, is platinum magnetic? Yeah, um, I don't, I don't know. No, yeah. Not, yeah. Like I gold isn't, it is, but the rest of it is. In the, yeah. So there's other metals in there. They're usually, day. they're tiny, tiny, tiny. So even if you find like the one with a little, metal bead on it the the platinums will be little just absolutely tiny yeah parts. yeah that's uh, amazing so let's talk about the tools so what what tools will a person need to get into this hobby so the more you get in it the more you might want like uh the sibs and special tweezers and whatever but really the only thing you definitely need is a magnet and a microscope so if you want to start looking just you can go outside and find anything magnetic um the chances are pretty low you want to increase the chances then go on a roof so if you can get on a roof that's uh, a great place to start as well but um yeah you don't need too much to actually start looking Just, well, let's talk uh, about the microscope sure what, what 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 kind of microscope works well for you well so again i'm i'm a little odd and i use a compound one just so that i can it's the way that I started, and it's the way that I just kept going as I've it's been. Sorry, what what is a compound microscope? So there's different types. There's a stereo microscope, and then there's a compound microscope. Uh, the stereo microscope, you can see more underneath it. Um, they usually have less magnification. The compound one breaks it up, and there's different uh, magnifications you can have. You just switch them over. It's got two eyepieces usually, and uh, that way I can get really close down into it and just see the texture of everything. Um, I do use my stereo microscope as well, just so that I can see. I've been really on the the search for some of those really, really large micrometeorites. So hopefully I'll find one, maybe like a, a millimeter large this year. We'll That'd see. be amazing. What they've been found, like a millimeter size have been found? 
Close. Yep. I think, uh, again, John, I think he's almost found one that was about a, a millimeter. Yeah. I yeah. found one that was elongated and it was about a millimeter, but I want to find one that is just fully spherical and spherical. And so what would one of these microscopes cost? It doesn't have to be too much. I mean, microscopes have been made for a long time, so you can find used ones for maybe 50, 60 bucks, uh, hmm. 100 bucks. Uh, you can find them for pretty cheap on eBay, maybe on uh, different websites. Uh, there are some that um, websites that make pretty decent ones that sell them for brand new for pretty cheap. Um, but it's a fairly then, big object, I guess. I mean, you're not you're not trying to see viruses. You're looking yeah. at you're looking at objects yeah. that are 0. 0.2, 0. 0.4 millimeters across. Like you can you can see these with your eyes. Yep. Yeah. I mean, they're tying again. I don't know if you want to actually actually see one. Um, well, I don't know if we could even show it, but no. I'll, I'll give it a shot and see. Yeah. So this is where I keep them. I don't know if I can focus in there, but there's 20 in each little circle. Wow. Okay. And uh, yeah, so I keep them in these little slides. But yeah, you can. They're like the size. If you took a, a pencil and just dabbed a dot on it, like that's about the size that. Right. They, right. They're. So mm-hmm. so magnet, and I'm assuming then like. Y- to you like wrap the magnet in a bag or something so that you can it's easy to get the the dust off of the magnet when you're done yep so yep, when i'm up on the roof i'll have it in uh just a sandwich bag and then i'll wrap it around really tightly so it's it's right up against it and then i'll go around and and get as much material as i can and then i'll kind of take that part off and put it into a mother bag and then i'll just keep loading up that bigger bag so that all the material goes in there. Yeah, so a sandwich bag is, is pretty helpful as and well. And how, how big is your magnet? Like, are you, like is it a fairly... Um, the, the, I have, like, I don't know if you've seen any of those videos where they do, like, uh, magnet fishing, but I use a similar one. It has a little uh, hook on the end, and that's kind of my handle. And so hmm. it's it's about maybe three or four inches uh, wide, and it's a circular one, and I just go around to all the and, spots. And where do you buy one of those? Are they from, like, the like eBay? I don't want uh, yeah. Amazon, but um, yeah, you can you can find them almost anywhere. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. So you got your magnet. You've got someone letting. You've got roof access. You're gathering up all these things. You're bringing them back. You've got your sieves. You've got your um, you've got your your microscope to identify them. But the big part of it as well is the photography. So how do you do the photography? Yeah. So that has just been kind of my favorite part of the whole thing. Um, when I started, again, there wasn't anybody taking pictures of them. So at the first time, I was like, oh, these are amazing. I could see some of the detail on them. Um, but then I started kind of just wanting to step my game up little by little so I could have the, the best images as possible. So now I have a, uh, an Olympus BH2 microscope, and then I have a custom uh, 3D printed stack shot system. So I'll take as you're looking underneath a microscope, there's only a certain field of view that you can see. So to take a, a picture of the entire micrometeorite, you have to take 20, 30, 40, 200 different images of them and then stack those together. Yeah. So I've been doing that. And then I, I diffuse my lighting so that it's not reflective. And uh, I'll stack those and then I'll edit the images. So it's become somewhat of a of a process yeah my my wife is a macro photographer she specializes in insect photography but it's the same kind of madness you wouldn't realize but taking an image of a small a tiny object is so difficult because your your depth of field is so small and for you to actually and so you're really every you know as you change the focus on your microscope or on your macro lens, you're just seeing these fractions of a millimeter at a time that's in focus and the rest is out of focus. And it makes for a really bad image. And the only way to actually produce an image that looks really cool is you is you is you focus stack. So you take 20 images at, you know, each one is a little bit more focused, and then you stack them up in Photoshop and generate this, this object that looks as if it's sort of like what the eye might see is this sort of 3d object or, or a, or a bug where you can see both its eyes and it's a little bit into its, its body as well. It's a, it's a really like, like I had no idea until I would sort of follow my wife along as a, 
you know, as a, as a photographer's assistant and yeah. she, you know, and I'd be like, oh, I'm going to take some pictures of this too. And then I would take pictures. And it's like, Oh, this is, this is, this is too, this terrible. This is so hard. And yet she makes these incredible images. And yeah. And sometimes she is, you know, you hear the camera just, you know, take five pictures at a time. And it's, it's literally changing the focus, change the focus, change the focus, take the picture. And then, and then the magic is done in, in Photoshop to stack those up. And, and a microscope has got to just be next level because your, your depth of field is so tiny. Yeah. I mean, the lucky thing is like everything's kind of stationary, you know, I'm yes, sure you're watching, it's not a bug. Like, it <laughs> you, the picture's over. Um, nothing's moving here. So I can control the lighting that doesn't change. Um, uh, I will just, I'll move the, um, the stage, just tiny, tiny increments. And usually I'll take around like 200, 300 different images and then I'll stack those together to create the one picture of the micrometeorite. Cause I want to go all the way to, to like, pass the, the point of the focal uh, point on the side of the micrometeorite, just so it's really crisp. And then you can see, um, you're only really seeing half of the micrometeorite. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's, it's become, it's become an art and I, and I, I love it. I, I've started taking the pictures of them like on different objects, just so people can understand, uh, the sizes of, of the micrometeorites. So, <clears throat> right. Like on a, on a coin or something. Yep. Yep. It's been a fun little journey. Yeah. That's kind of amazing. Um, now we, uh, we got news. Someone mentioned this in chat, uh, Kaizy 808 mentioned this in chat. And I think this, I was going to get to this as well is that we saw recent news that potentially a, a meteorite, a bolide, that hit the earth was interstellar in origin, not just from the solar system. Mm -hmm. um, how would you know? Have you, have you, have, if that's gotta be in your brain that, that, that you could be looking at a particle that's interstellar, not just interplanetary. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's pretty tricky, but the origin is, is a hard puzzle to solve. Um, we've been trying to do that for, for a while. So, uh, it's not done yet. We'll have to keep, I mean, so right now the idea is that most come from either, um, uh, comets and asteroids, mostly from the asteroid belt. Um, but like you're saying, like if somehow, if one traveled here and it wasn't from around here, like, I don't know, it'd be hard to, yeah. well, I mean know. the way, I mean, I'm assuming the way you would do it is that you would have to do radiometric dating of the meteorite and the way I mean, that's how they learned the age of the solar system was they found all these meteorites, and they just kept determining based on the ratios of of radioactive elements inside of them, that yeah. they all charted back to 4.5 billion years ago. And so that told us that everything in the solar system formed at the same time, including the earth and all the meteorites. But if you got your hands on a meteorite, and you did a, a radiometric dating, and it turned out to be 8.7 billion years, then you would know that you had an object that had come from outside the solar system, it had been here earlier, or even the other way around something that was only a billion years old, although that would be a little trickier, because you know, it could be some geological process, but something that's yeah. older would be or if you can somehow luckily start with knowing, um, like what type of material is from the location. Like, so we know, uh, we have lunar meteorites. Yeah, we know we have yeah. meteorites because we already know we have samples from those locations. Um, obviously we can't necessarily do that, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty hard, but I think it's doable. I think yeah. we can figure it out. Yeah. And, uh, um, you know, we know that a lot of the meteorites that fall to earth come from kind of mother objects. You've got, Vesta class objects that that were all part of one large object that was shattered a long time ago. And then we're seeing meteorites. in in many cases, you can kind of tie back their, their families. Do you get any visual representation of like, you're starting to see families in the objects? Yeah, not not yet. It's, it's difficult because right. So these are tiny in space. And they're just they've been tiny their entire lives mm. and then they finally get here so yeah being able to it's i don't know it's difficult yeah yeah but but i mean you said like like you're seeing like like now i'm assuming you're looking through a field of these of objects and you spot the meteorite 
Yeah. And and so you mentioned sometimes there's like a like a, a shape, there's an elongation, there's other metals poking out of the surface of it. What are the what are some of the other signs that you're looking for that that tell you, okay, this is a meteorite? Oh, instead of like the other material that I'm, that I'm yeah, looking at? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. well, it's, it can be pretty easy on some, uh, on some roofs just because maybe, uh, the material that transferred to that roof is mostly like, uh, light colored and rocky and tan. So when uh, I'm looking underneath the microscope and this dark black sphere kind of sticks out, then I know to just to pull that aside and then I'll zoom in closer and look for those certain, um, physical features. Um, so that they'll pick out on some roofs pretty easily. Um, but on other roofs, um, it'll be all dark material. And um, sometimes there's a lot of pollution that isn't um, little iron spheres, but it'll be something that you might think could be a micrometeorite. But if you see those continuously, then you know that, that it's not a micrometeorite because you usually don't find the same thing often. Mm. So I don't know. Sometimes it's, it's easy to pick out. Sometimes it's, it's more difficult, but the more pollution always makes it more difficult to, to look through. Yeah. I mean, I think about like, you know, the, there's people who figure out the genders of chickens and, and they don't know how they do it. They just are able to do it because you just look at enough of them and you know, so an expert will tell you that's male, that's female, that's male, you know, and you keep going. And after a while you are an expert at it and yet you can't tell anyone why, you know, that that's the male that's and that's the female. I feel that's where I am. Too, Is that where you're I, at? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right now, sometimes I'll, I'll put my headphones on. I'll look under, I don't even think while I'm doing it anymore. It's just the, it's a process of just, doing it now so yeah, yeah they'll, they'll pick out and it's weird even when i'm under there I'm like how did i find that i wasn't even looking it's sometimes you know if you're driving you know you don't remember that last mile sometimes that yeah that'll happen to me as well so what comes next do you think for this for this field for this hobby <sighs> it's a good question i'm not sure there's a lot that we still don't know right i mean they were just talking about origin and stuff like that so I mean, it's still new. There's a lot. The great thing, though, is, is that people like myself or and anybody can go and find it. And anybody can contribute. So yeah. there's a lot of people that are around the world that aren't necessarily studying micrometeorites that can definitely help a lot in, in furthering the knowledge. Um, I don't know where it's going to go. There's a lot that I want to kind of figure out still. But... but I sort of imagine, like, in most hobbies, well, I mean, for example, when it come back to macro photography with my wife, you know, she's got a bucket list. She wants to see this bug, that bug. She wants to, you know, use improve her technique in this way, that way. Like the more the the more expertise you get in some field, the the more you begin to create these very, I don't know, very specific targeted plans for what you would like to accomplish in in the future. And I wonder you know, what's a, what's a, what's a, your next Mount Everest that if you could climb it, it would be, you know, it would make a big difference, but you're still waiting. I'm, you know, it's, a good question. So I, it's basically my Everest is just more unknowns. So I find things that before I found it, I never would, it would have never been uh, a goal to be able to find that thing because I'd never thought that it was a possible thing to find. I found different micrometeorites that don't look like anything that we've found before that have certain um, features on them that haven't been found in other micrometeorites. Hmm. So those are the ones that are really fun to find. Um, and those are kind of the ones that I that I've been looking for now just I go through and I find most of them will be those barred olivines, like I said before. Um, but some of them that I pick out that don't look like micrometeorites, but end up being micrometeorites. Those are the fun ones to find. Um, I found unmelted micrometeorites. Those are um, pretty amazing to find. But yeah, there's just more. It's it's a rush every time I find one at, at all. Right. So. Well, I, I guess, I mean, it's sort of like the more you find, the better chances you get at finding a rare one. Mm -hmm. And and eventually you're going to, you know, if you find thousands, you will find one that nobody's ever seen before or has some interesting characteristics that nobody has ever has ever um 
you know, I sort of imagine it's like Pokemons or something, you know, you're collecting, you got lots of commons, you got lots of uncommons, you know, you got some rares and now you're finding the uniques to really fill out your, your collection. Yeah, that's kind of, that's the fun area for me right now. Just finding like the really, really unique ones. Or like we were talking earlier, trying to find an eye type, the ones that are uh, metallic or just like really iron. If I could find one like that, that'll be yeah. no sure that it's a, I, I might have one in the collection right now. I just, I don't know if I can confirm it. So yeah, it's funny though. I mean, those are found using a, like usually using like a metal detector and people go and ask farmers for permission to scan their field. And then they'll go, so it's kind of like the same thing as what you're doing, right? And then right. they'll they'll run a a metal detector. They usually like it'll be like tractor mounted or even, you know, on on a on an ATV or something like that. And they'll they'll scan across the field slowly, looking for anything that's metallic under the ground. And then they'll find something, and then they'll go and dig it up. And oh, it's a bottle cap. Oh it's a tin can. Oh, it's a right. And then eventually they'll, they'll find something and you're like, wow, it is a meteorite and it will be embedded six feet down a chunk of melted space rock space metal that yeah. is, that was deposited there a thousand years ago from some meteorite strike. And, and it's, you know, it's can be various sizes. So it's, it's funny how the hobby is the same, how the search is the same. It's just a scale issue, but the, you know, I guess they don't need the microscope in the same way that, that you do. And, and it's I fun to look at them anyway, but yeah. 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 And it's funny, like, it's funny how, like with my wife, you know, I was like, why bugs? I was like, like, why is this what you like to do? And she was like, well, cause they're everywhere. Like if I want to go and see a lion or if I want to go and see a snow leopard or whatever, yeah, I've got to get on a flight. I got to go to the Himalayas. I got to sit down <clears throat> in some, you know, some little uh, tent for seven weeks, and maybe I'll spot one. But I can just go anywhere, look in any backyard with a macro lens, and I can see the same process. I can see predators ch setting up traps for prey. I can see, I can see uh, mating rituals. I can see interesting social dynamics, and it's all just playing out right in front of us wherever you go. And it's like with this. If you can get your hands, get to a roof, you can start searching for rocks that fell from space. Yeah. Well, a roof is a, is a great place. But even if you can't get on a roof, because not everybody's going to be able to get up on a roof, um, the gutters of your own house are great. Or even, it's really, really hard to do, but I've, I've even found them on the road in front of my house. So yeah. you just, yeah, if you go look, you can, you can find them. But yeah, like you're, your wife isn't an understatement. There are so many little creatures everywhere in every little spot. That, yeah. yeah, it's, it's got to be. And I had, amazing. you know, and I had no idea. Um, and now when I now that I now I look at the world in a different way, and it's yeah. interesting. And now I'm now I'm going to have to look at dirt in a different way. So thank you. <laughs> There's a micrometer right there. Yeah. Everywhere you step, you might have just stepped on a micrometer. Yeah. So Scott, if people want to sort of follow your work, what's the best place to do that? Um, so on Twitter, I just post strictly about uh, micrometeorites. I have all the pictures that I'll take. Uh, any information that comes about, I'll just post it on there. Um, on my Instagram, um, that's where I kind of post all. I do a little bit of macro photography too and just play around with everything. So that's kind of like more of the fun area. Um, both are at ScottMP123. So yeah, you can follow me there. And then. And you've got your website. Yep. Yeah. And then the website is micro uh meteorites.com uh, perfect and, yeah, well anybody can message me i love chatting with people so well scott it's absolute pleasure to talk to you thank you so much for i guess adding a new hobby to my hobby stack i will uh i'll let you know when i've got my my when i'm starting to pull material off of my my new roof and i'll uh, i'll get back to you yeah let's work on this let's get you one i'm in i'm in i'm in 100 all right well thanks a lot absolutely thanks